Hi, everybody. Um, I got some requests on the discussion board asking me to make a video going through the final exam the same way that I went through the midterm exam. And um, those requests made me really happy because it means that there are people who want to improve their understanding of econometrics, even though it won't affect their final grade in the class. So um, thank you. And of course, I'll be happy to go through the questions. So we're going to start off with number one, which is a question about heteroscedasticity. So if you remember when we were doing regression analysis, we make an assumption of what's called homoscedasticity. And homoscedasticity just means that if we have homoscedasticity means that if we have a bunch of data points around a regression line, that they are generally evenly spaced around that line of best fit. And it's better to see that contrasted with what a violation of this assumption looks like, which is called heteroscedasticity. Where we have this kind of funnel shape to the residuals of our regression line. Okay, so it's a really good fit down here and a really bad fit up there. All right, and the question is asking, you know, basically what problem does this create? All right, so the first two of the options are talking about the slope and the intercept. And if you notice, the line of best fit for both of these, the homoscedastic case and the heteroscedastic case, are basically the same. You can assume I drew them the same, right? Heteroscedasticity isn't going to bias the um, slope and intercept parameters. What, uh, where we get a problem is when, when, when we want to talk about the um, goodness of fit, or not, yeah, goodness of fit, or um, the noisiness of the regression, right? Um, how likely is it that due to sampling bias, the population slope is actually zero, right? So we're talking about the standard error here, all right? And notice that in the homoscedastic case, we can say, you know, pretty definitively, we can make a comment about the entire regression line, about the goodness of fit. Uh, but in the heteroscedastic case, we would have to say, well, it's really noisy up here and really not noisy down here, so we can't make a comment about the entire regression. And so that's why the issue with heteroscedasticity is that it causes the standard errors to be biased. All right, question two is about, asks about something called residuals. I always need to grab that. All right, um, and if you remember, the residual is going to be equal to, I'm going to use the term epsilon hat i. And that's going to be equal to the actual value. Let's see, we've got 100 and 105. So we take the actual value, yi, and we subtract the fitted value, y hat i, where y hat i is equal to beta naught hat, the estimated intercept, plus beta 1 hat, the estimated slope times xi, okay? And the question tells us that um, yi, oh, well, that's so thick. Let me try that one again. Uh, it tells us that yi is equal to 105. Um, it tells us that xi is equal to nine, or 100. It tells us that beta naught hat is equal to um, 20, and it tells us that beta 1 hat is equal to 0 0.75. All right, so to answer this question, we just use this formula here to find that y hat 
i is going to be equal to 20 plus 0 0.75 times 100 or 75 times 100 plus 20 or 95 and then we go up here we take yi which is 105 we subtract 95 which gives us n all right so question two is 10. all right question three this is a topic that's going to come up multiple times which is um, omitted variable bias. I know I added an extra bump to the end. Don't judge me. Um, omitted variable bias. Okay. And the idea here is we know that in multiple regression, we can choose to control for the effect of variables that we think might be confounding our analysis. And what uh, studying omitted variable bias lets us do is actually quantify, you know, how is our um, estimated relationship going to change once we control for a variable, all right? So think about this. Let's write out two regression models, all right? The first one is our dependent variable y, and we're going to regress that on one variable of interest x and another variable that we think might be important, z. Okay, but we also have this other regression. Use different uh, superscripts to show that these are going to be different numbers when we calculate it. All right, so we have one regression where we're controlling for z. We can call that the long regression. We have one regression where we're not controlling for z, we'll call that the short regression. And we want to know um, how will uh, beta 1, the coefficient on x in the long regression, differ from beta squiggly one, um, the coefficient in the short regression, all right? And to find that answer, we need to think about one more regression, which is this time we regress x on z. Okay, so this time we're looking at the relationship between x and z, rather the relationship between y and x. Okay, and for these three regressions, we can write out a formula showing that beta 1, so that's the coefficient on x in the long regression, is going to be equal to, or sorry, beta squiggly 1, is going to be equal to beta 1, this is the relationship between x and y after controlling for z, plus the product of beta 2, that's the relationship between z and y, times, or sorry, beta 2, sorry about that, times gamma 1, the relationship between z and x, okay? So this is our omitted variable bias formula. Okay, and we can think of this as saying that the relationship between x and y when not controlling for z is equal to this kind of true value plus this bias term. Okay, this bias term is going to pull our estimated value away from our true value. Okay. And what the question is asking is, when is the bias going to be positive, all right? So for this term to be positive, we need both beta 2 to be positive and gamma 1 to be positive. And so let's go from the bottom up. Beta 2 is greater than 0. That's good. That's positive. And x1 and x2 are negatively correlated. That means gamma 1 will be negative, so it can't be that one. Uh, for c, beta 2 is negative. That pulls that off the table. This beta 2 is 0. That means that there's no bias, so we're going to get rid of that. 
and then the first one, beta 2, is greater than 0, and x1 and x2 are positively correlated. That means that beta 2 is positive and gamma 1 is positive, so that's going to be our answer. Okay, question 4. This is a question about um, avoiding perfect collinearity. So if we have um, a categorical variable in our data set, and we want to encode that by including a binary variable for each value of the categorical variable, we want to include one variable fewer than the number of categories that there are, because otherwise all of the variables that um, represent each of the categories will always sum to one for each observation. That's a perfect linear relationship, and we will have um, perfect collinearity. We won't be able to estimate the effect of either of them. So if we have six ethnic groups, we want to have five dummy variables. Um, you know, if we have five ethnic groups, we want four. If we have two, we want one, et cetera, et cetera. All right. Next one, this is a simple question about the null hypothesis. It's asking, um, what does it mean when we're um, testing the hypothesis that beta 2 equals 0? We're saying that x2 has no effect on y. The relationship, you know, if x2 goes up by one unit, then y will not change at all. So again, there's no relationship between the two. Uh, question 6, this is about the zero conditional mean assumption. which means that we are assuming that the, in math terms, we're assuming that the expected value of the error term conditional on the value of any independent variable is equal to zero. Um, in kind of plain language, we're assuming that there are no um, important omitted variables. So basically all the variables that we're not including are either not correlated with our independent variables, x, which would mean that gamma 1 is equal to 0, or they're not correlated with our independent variable y, or sorry, our dependent variable y, in which case beta 2 is equal to 0. Okay, so we're assuming that we're not leaving out anything important. And then another word for this is we're assuming that our independent variables x um, is n, or sorry, give me another answer. We're assuming that x is exogenous. Okay, and the flip side to this, if this term doesn't equal zero, that means we have omitted variable bias and x is endogenous. So that's just a term we uh, learned in the lectures. So this one, we're saying that uh, the expect expected value of the error term conditional on x is not equal to zero. That means x is endogenous. Question seven, we're talking about panel data and having entity and time fixed effects. Um, this is also a kind of a question about perfect collinearity. Um, we are only looking, we only want to control for variables that vary by both time and by entity, um, because if they don't, then they will be perfectly collinear with those fixed effects. All right, question eight, we are talking about functional form, and we are talking about how there are um, different ways to use natural logarithms, all right? Specifically, we can write four different ways of uh, using natural logarithms in our regression. First is to not use natural logarithms. This is called a level level regression. We can write it, you know, yi is equal to beta naught plus beta one xi plus the error term, all right? And we would interpret beta one as um, a one unit change in x is going to have a beta one unit change in y. All right, so basic. All right, the next one, we're going to introduce the natural log, um, is a log level regression. And it's called that because we're going to have on the left-hand side of our equation the natural log of y instead of just y. Okay, but the right-hand side is going to look the same. All right, and here we interpret the coefficient as saying a one unit. 
it change in x is going to have a beta 1 times 100 percent change in y. Okay, so if beta 1 is 1 in both of these, then here it's saying y is going to go up by one unit. Here it's saying y is going to double. Okay, so very different interpretation. All right, we also have the level log regression. So here we've got yi equals We have the natural log of our independent variable. Here we'd interpret beta 1 as saying a 100% change in x, or a doubling of x, is going to lead to a beta 1 unit change in y. And finally, we have a log log regression, where we have the natural log of our dependent variable, and the natural log of our independent variable. And basically what we're saying here is that a 100% increase in x is going to be a beta 1 times 100% change in y. All right, or a 1% change in x is going to have a beta 1% change in y, either one. Okay, so here we're asking to interpret the coefficient beta 1. Okay, so notice that our dependent variable wages is in natural log, and we're asking to interpret beta 1, which is attached to education, which is in levels. Okay, so we're looking at a um, logged dependent variable and a level independent variable. Okay, so we're, we're going to have a one year increase in education and then a percent increase in wages. So that's what we do. All right, question nine. This is asking about um, difference in differences. And it's asking specifically, oops, I didn't want to move that around. Thank you. Um, so if you remember the way difference in differences works is, you know, if we have oh, sorry, I'm upside up on. Um, you know, if we have two groups, remember we need two sources of variation, so we've got a Pre treatment period and a post treatment period. And we have um, our treated group, the path, let's say, looks like this. And our control group, the path. So this is our treated group. Uh, it goes from being not treated to treated. They raise their minimum wage or they, um, you know, raise their minimum drinking age um, at the time period of the dotted line. So this is our treated state. And then our control state is never treated. Um, their speed limit or their minimum wage or their drinking age stays the same across the whole uh, period. Right. And the way difference in differences works econometrically is we're basically taking this green line here, we're moving it down and putting it here, and then the d distance between these two lines is going to be the treatment effect. Okay. The important thing is that we need to know that this green line is what would have happened to the blue line if it wasn't treated. All right. So let's say the green line, you know, instead looked like, um, you know, looked like this, right? Then when we move the green line down, we would find no effect of the treatment, right? But that's probably not appropriate, right? Because it looks like um, the 
green and blue states, something different is happening um, in them even before the treatment. So we can't really use this as a counterfactual for this after the treatment. What we want to see to know that we've got a good counterfactual is um, parallel trends especially in the pre-treatment period. So what we want is for the, um, in this pre-treatment period here, we want the green line and the blue line to be parallel, okay? So this generally means that um, the green state is a good control for the blue state, whereas uh, this or even this, right, are going to be violations of the parallel trend at some point, okay? So the answer to this one, we want average health trends to be the same for both groups in the absence of innervation, in, um, intervention. All right, here we've got another um, example of logs and levels. So it's asking about the relationship between bank credit and GDP. So here we've got a logged dependent variable and a logged independent variable. So we're going to be dealing with this log log specification. So we're going to have percent changes on the left and the right. So if bank credit increases by 1%, GDP is going to increase by 0.52%. All right, question 11. If you remember in the um, video on instrumental variables, we talked about how um, one example of an instrumental variable is we want to know the effects of smoking on birth weight but we can't run a trial where we randomly choose pregnant women to start smoking because that would be um, unethical. So instead what we do is we find a bunch of uh, pregnant women who are smokers and we give them um, pamphlets encouraging them to quit and we give them um, a free supply of nicotine gum and hopefully that'll make them more likely to quit than the women who don't receive the pamphlets. All right, and that's an example of what's called an encouragement design, and it's a type of instrumental variable estimation. All right, question 12 um, is asking, when would a log transformation not be useful? Um, so if you remember variables that exhibit diminishing returns, we do want a log transformation for that. Remember, a, if you uh, remember like in high school algebra, Right, if uh, we have um, the graph of just y equals ln of x, right, let's do a, a Cartesian coordinate plane. The graph is going to look something like this. Okay, so you can see it has that diminishing return shape. You can also see that it's always positive, and you can also it. We, um, if you remember that first uh, problem set you did where you kind of crunched down life expectancy from a non-normal distribution to a more normal distribution. The only place where we don't want to use log transformations in this question is variables that are already percentages or proportions. All right, question 13, um, it's asking about instrumental variables and the assumptions behind instrumental variables. And so if you remember, there are three main things we need in order to use Z as an instrument for X. We want independence. That means Z is as good as random, or as good as randomly assigned. We want the exclusion restriction. which is that Z only affects Y through its effect on X, our endogenous variable. And we want um, monotonicity. Which is no defiers, if you remember how we can have compliers, always takers, never takers, and defiers. Um, the monotonicity assumption means that there can be no defiers in our sample. Okay, so going through our possible answers, that's strict monotonicity, so we don't want that. That's the exclusion restriction, we don't want that. 
that's our independence assumption, so it can't be that, so it has to be A. Um, and actually, if this was true, then we couldn't use Z as an instrument for X because we wouldn't have a first stage. So if you remember, for instrumental variables, we have our first stage regression, where we regress X on Z. And then our second stage, where we take the fitted values from this first stage and regress Y on those. Okay. Next one, it's asking, in which of the following cases is the um, dependent variable binary? So remember, binary variables only either equal 0 or 1. Okay, so domestic product of a country, nope. Um, indicates whether or not an adult is college dropout. That seems to be right, right? Zero would be you are not a college dropout. One indicates you are. But let's look at the other ones. Household cons consumption expenditure. No, that takes values between zero and one. Same thing with children in a family. You can have more than zero or one kids. So B is the only one that makes sense. All right, which of the following is not true? All right, the first one, the point X bar, Y bar always lies on the regression line. That is true um, thanks to the definition of the intercept. Two, the sum of residuals is always zero. That's true. Um, if you remember, we talked about that's why we have to square the residuals um, because the sum of them is always going to be zero. The regression line minimizes the sum of squared residuals. That's also true. Um, that's the entire, like, that's how we get the regression line. That's where the term least squares comes from. So the last one, there are always as many points above the fitted line as there are below it. So one way to think about that is if you have an outlier. Right, let's say that, you know, your data looks like this. And you've got one really influential point here, right? So the regression line would look something like, you know, this. Right, and so there is only one point above and lots of points below. All right, 16, manipulation around the threshold and nonlinearity bias are dangers when utilizing what? Um, this one, you would just have to watch the video on regression discontinuity designs. Those are dangers of regression discontinuity designs. 17, um, which of the following groups can exist by the strict monotonicity assumption? Again, you should know that that is the defiers, the people who uh, move in the opposite direction of what we would expect the instrumental variable to do. These are the women who would quit smoking on their own, but then they receive um, free gum and they say, you know what, screw you, I'm not, I'm going to keep smoking. Um, which is silly, which is good, because that means that the monotonicity assumption is probably being met. All right, 18, the sample average of the OLS residuals is what? All right, this one actually goes back to here. Remember, we showed that the sum of the residuals is zero. So if the sum of the residuals is zero, then the sum of the residuals divided by the number of residuals is also going to be zero. All right, 19, we're talking about um, using a quadratic regression, all right? And um, if you remember, quadratic regression is a way to, rather than fit a line to our data, if our data, you know, looks like this, say, then rather than fitting, you know, a line, which would look something like this, we'd like to fit a parabola to our data. And we can do that by estimating this regression equation, where if that's y and that's x, then if we estimate the model, um, yi equals beta naught plus beta one xi plus beta two xi squared plus the error term, then we'll find the equation for this blue parabola, all right? And notice that on this blue parabola, there is this turning point, right? So if x is below this critical value here, we'll call this like x star, then increasing x is going to increase y, but if it's above this value, then increasing x is going to decrease y. Okay, 
and the formula for this value is going to be um, two times beta two um, over, or sorry, beta one over two times beta two. Okay, so here we've got beta one is one twenty. Beta 2 is 2, so it would be 120 divided by 2 times 2, which is 4. So 120 divided by 4 is 30. All right, question 20. Uh, this is talking about regression discontinuity designs. So remember, regression discontinuity designs, or RDD. We use those when we have a... running variable like age and then the age hits a discontinuity where something unique happens so um, one of the papers you read is you turn 21 and suddenly you can drink okay and we're basically fitting our regression line and then also estimating this jump here. You know, so the model would be yi equals beta 1 plus beta 1 xi plus beta 2 di, where di equals 1 if xi is greater than or equal to 21. All right. And it's asking us which of the following scenarios lend themselves to RDD? All right, so we want to know that if there's a running variable and a cutoff. That's the first one. A test score indicates eligibility for a college grant. So the running variable is going to be the test score, and the cutoff value is whatever value um, above which you get the college grant. Two, income threshold determines eligibility for a tax break. Running variable is income. Cutoff is the threshold. Random subset of Swedish munici municipalities get additional funding for school. All right, so there's not really a cutoff there, so that's probably the answer, but let's look at the last one just to be sure. Vote shares in a two-party system determines which party gets into office. So there's a, that's actually an example in the video. Uh, the running variable is the vote share. The cutoff is 50% um, plus one. All right, in the ideal randomized experiment, so remember... Uh, this is actually, I think, the second week of lectures. We talked about why random experiments are considered the gold standard in causal inference. So um, if, we, if you remember potential outcome notation, we need to know the counterfactual. So we can never actually know the individual causal effect because that would require um, observing both potential outcomes for an individual. We don't have to control for variables that are correlated with the dependent variable because the um, because randomization will mean that the treatment is independent from the dependent variable. All right, that's basically the same thing as saying that self-selection bias is not a serious issue. All right, what we can do is we can estimate the average causal effect for all individuals participating in the experiment. All right, 22, difference in differences. Um, this um, kind of goes back to the question earlier about varying by entity and by time, but again, we need data covering at least two time points, given the treatment affected a subset of the population. We need panel data, and the treatment has to have two sources of variation. All right, what is the limitation of using log transformations? Um, and this is pretty simple. You can't use logs if a variable takes on zero or negative values. You know, you should know from math that the natural logarithm of zero or negative numbers is undefined, so we just can't use logs in that case. All right, number 24, what is the meaning of the term heteroscedasticity? So again, this goes back to our first question here, and you should know that it means that the variance of the errors is not constant. All right, here we have a level log model. So that goes back to uh, this little matrix here. Um, 
So we want a 1% change in x is associated with a change in y of beta 1 over 100. We've got a percent change in x and a level change in y. All right, here, the estimate of an explanatory variable which is not significant at the 5% level. Okay, so let's see. 95% um, confidence interval doesn't include zero, so that means it would be statistically significant. That also indicates statistical significance. That also indicates statistical significance. Remember, we want a high t-stat or a low p-value. So here, the p-value is high, so it's not statistically significant. All right, this one is saying which of the following are all sensible specifications of a nonlinear model. Um, this one you kind of have to look closely. Um, you know, this is a quadratic regression. This is a log level. This is a log log. Here it looks like a log log, but notice that we're regressing y on its own natural logarithm. So that makes no sense. So, well, you wouldn't want to regress a variable on itself. Okay, so that's our answer there. Least squares estimator of the slope coefficient is unbiased. So what does unbiased mean? Um, and what it means is not that the slope coefficient will always be equal to the population parameter, right? There's always noise from sampling. Um, but it's saying that if we take um, a bunch of samples over and over and over again, then on average, the value will be equal to the true parameter. All right, R squared, remember R squared is the... Um, it's a measure of goodness of fit. And it is equal to the explained sum of squares over the total sum of squares. So the answer to this one is the explained sum of squares as a proportion of the total sum of squares. All right. And the last multiple choice question we are asking which of the following is equal to average SAT scores of Hispanic females who attend private school? Okay, so here we've got three binary or dummy variables. All right, so female Hispanics who attend private schools, so that means female is going to equal one, Hispanic is going to equal one, and private is going to equal one. So on average, um, we're going to, and everyone gets beta zero. So it's going to be that, the sum of all of these, since all three binary variables are going to be equal to one because we're looking at Hispanic females who attend private school. All right, number 31. So this is the difference between the average treatment effect and the local average treatment effect. So the local average treatment effect is something that we have when we do um, instrumental variable estimations. And instrumental variable um, two-stage least squares is going to identify the local average treatment effect, not the average treatment effect. The local average treatment effect is the average treatment effect for, for compliers um, in IV estimation. So you have the, the, the frequent for equal credit. Um, an example of when the two things might be different is if you remember we talked about the foster care example, how we had some um, evidence that children might be better off if they were left with their abusive families, but you have to remember that we're doing instrumental variable estimation here. We're only looking at the um, effect of foster care for those kids on the border where some investigators think they should be left in their homes and some investigators think they should be taken away. Um, we don't, you know, we're not estimating the effect for kids that everyone thinks should be taken away. That the, the treatment effect is probably positive there. All right, question 32, this is just a test of whether or not you know the limited variable bias formula, which we wrote down here. So notice that here is the long regression, here is the kind of side regression, here's the short regression. So basically you would just need to say that it would be equal beta one plus beta two times L one. All right, simple test of whether or not you knew the um, limited variable bias formula. Question 33, this is about the parallel trends assumption. Basically, is parallel trends being met? So what we do is we look at the pre-treatment period. Uh, state one is the treated state, state two is the control state. And looking at the pre-treatment period, yes, trends are parallel. So state two is likely a good control because trends are parallel in the pre-treatment period. All right. Question 34, this tricked a lot of people. Okay, so we're looking at a random, uh, randomized controlled trial where 
Ti is the dose of a drug that is randomly assigned. So we just regress um, blood pressure on the dose of the drug. And then we do another model where we estimate we regress blood pressure on dose of the drug and height and weight. And we're saying, how do we expect the estimate to change? And the answer is that we shouldn't expect it to change at all um, because dosage is randomly assigned. All right, and because dosage is randomly assigned, it's not going to be correlated with weight or, or age. All right, so going back to our OVB formula, this is saying that gamma one is going to equal zero. And if gamma one, that was ugly. Um, if, if gamma one equals zero, then the coefficient in the short regression is gonna be equal to the coefficient in the long regression. Okay, so um, this is why we, this is why randomized controlled trials are so awesome. We don't need to worry about selection bias or omitted variables because the um, treatment isn't gonna be correlated with any confounders. All right, question 35. Um, here you would base, you, this is basically just, do you know how to set up a difference of differences model? So again, we've got two sources of variation. We have variation in time and variation across states. And so the way you would set this up is you would have, um, you know, maybe the natural log of employment and you'd regress that on um, a variable indicating New Jersey, a variable indicating um, the year 19, or maybe you do year fixed effects or month fixed effects, um, some kind of fixed effect term, and then um, a variable for the minimum wage. Okay, and you would be, um, again, you would just say, I would check for parallel trends. We're assuming parallel trends. Um, maybe you'd want to use clustered standard errors. Um, actually, because there are only two clusters, you don't need to use clustered standard errors. Um, oh, uh, robust standard errors, something like that. All right. And question 36. All right, so... Part A is asking you to interpret the coefficient. Notice that we have a log level regression. So you would interpret it as saying that students with the scholarship make 30%, 37% more. And yes, it's statistically significant. You know, we have a T stat of like 40 or something. Well, probably actually not 40, like 10. Um, still really high. Okay, so that's A. You have to know the log, log, log level regression. B, there's gonna be selection bias. Students who get the scholarship are also um, have higher ability, so his model won't identify the causal effect of the scholarship. And for C, you should notice that what we have here is a regression discontinuity design. Um, the scholarship is our cutoff, our discontinuity, and the running variable is SAT scores. So you would probably just wanna regress um, log wages on SAT scores, the scholarship. Um, if you want to get really fun, you could interact the two to make sure you have a better fit post-treatment. And then you might want to say, I graph them to make sure there's no nonlinearity or um, manipulation around the threshold. And that is the last question. All right, so I hope that answers all of your questions on the exam. Um, if you have any more, just post them in Blackboard. And I just wanna say, I had a great semester. Um, this is my first time teaching this class online. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned that econometrics can be more exciting than you thought it was, if not objectively exciting. Um, I really enjoyed reading your final papers. If you haven't gotten the chance yet, go on the discussion board and look up um, what some of your fellow students have done. There's some interesting work that I think you might want to read about. It won't take you very long to read it and you might learn something. So again, thank you. Um, you know, 
if you want to go on, rate my professor and give me feedback so that I know how I can make this class better for the future or just send me an email, um, I'd appreciate that. Um, I want to um, better be able to um, educate you guys. So thank you for a great semester and best of luck. Bye.